We all have, I suppose, characters in history for which we feel a certain connection, or that captures our interest in a more fundamental way than others. Characters for whom our imagination grows over time and leads to a kind of relationship where we almost think that we know that individual. For me, that person, or even friend, is Marcus Aurelius, who ruled between 161 and 180 CE, last of the five good emperors. Perhaps best known for his stoic key work, commonly known as the Meditations. And of course, for co-starring against Russell Crowe in the film Gladiator. But there is so much more to Marcus Aurelius than his stoic writings. He is clearly one of the most intriguing and interesting characters of ancient Rome, both as emperor and as person. And still, he seemed to be unknown to most people. Here is the first episode of what I intend to be an ongoing series of non-consecutive parts about the emperor Marcus Aurelius. In this episode, we fittingly turn our interest to the famous equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius one of the most astonishing works of art that remains from all antiquity. I am your host Morten Eriksson. Welcome to Ancient History. The equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius is remarkable in so many ways. It is one of the very few Roman or Greek statues that have remained above ground continuously since antiquity. It is also the most famous. Already this makes it quite extraordinary. As the Meditations, it has contributed widely to the mythology of Marcus Aurelius' persona. It has, however, not escaped wholly untouched. And at an age of almost 2,000 years, time have worn it. Both the horse and Marcus himself have been restored several times. Still, much less so than many marble sculptures. And so, there is a consensus that the sculpture's appearance and Marcus Aurelius' famous gesture is authentic. The sculpture that is made from hollow cast bronze is larger than life size and measures some 4.24 meters from the hoof to the top of Marcus Aurelius' head. It is a wonderful piece of art and if you are in Rome, go see it. It is both beautiful and astonishing. Originally, the whole composition was gilded, but today we see only patches of the golden surface. It is not fully known where the statue was originally placed. However, we know that before 1538 it stood next to the Lateran Basilica, and between 1538 and 1981 it stood in the centre of Piazza di Campidoglio. Normally, these kinds of statues would usually have been placed in central Rome, which implies that it might have been moved once more sometime after its completion. As an example, a gilded equestrian bronze statue of the young Octavianus was erected in the Forum in 43 BCE. So it is clear that these kind of statues signaled special prestige. In total, we know of 32 equestrian statues that have been placed in the city. 22 of them still stood in the 5th century CE. Most of them of emperors, although statues of the scale of Marcus Aurelius would surely have been rare. However, due to the size of the piece, the process of moving it is complex even with modern technology. And that might imply that the placing in the Lateran where Marcus Aurelius had spent his childhood, is in fact the original place of the statue, or somewhere close to it. The first surviving evidence of this placing appears already in the 10th century. We cannot know why it managed to survive in continuous display even after the end of antiquity, especially since there is evidence that the original identity of many public portraits had started to be forgotten already in the 4th century. Adding to this, after the 4th century, Marcus had come to be connected with accusations of Christian persecution, and thus would best have been forgotten, 
So why then? It is clear that the identification after antiquity became confused more or less for a millennium. There has been speculation that the statue over time became to be confused with Constantine the Great, the first Christian emperor, and that its placement next to the Lateran Basilica enabled this identification since Constantine had seen the church constructed, and thus Marcus escaped oblivion in the Middle Ages. Over the centuries, the statue came to be identified with various historical figures. As one example, early pilgrims apparently identified Marcus with Theodoric the Great, the Gothic king of Italy in the 5th and 6th centuries. Nonetheless, in the 1480s, the identification was again setting on Marcus Aurelius. Let us now look at the statue itself. For it is not only a beautiful work of art, but a piece of propaganda. At the time of its completion, it was evidently intended as an integral part of the imperial imagery and of the power projection of the emperor. The details that can be seen, and perhaps those that are lost but still identifiable, hold clues to how the work was intended to be read by the observer. We are all familiar with the general expression of the statue. Marcus Aurelius is sitting on his horse in civilian clothes, holding his hand in front of him. The horse itself is animated, looking as if it is taking a step with the foremost right hoof. Both the rider and the beast are made in meticulous detail. The details of Marcus' head may hold the solution to the dating of the statue. Much of the features were then and is now part of his public image. His curly hair, his rich beard, and the way they are portrayed corresponds to what is called the third portrait type, dating it to after the time of his succession in 161. Some further details point to a later dating still, probably sometime after 170, or that the statue was even raised posthumously after 180. Marcus is dressed in civilian clothes fitting a patrician. He is wearing a tunic and over his right shoulder a paludamentum, a type of cloak or cape often worn by military commanders. On his feet he is wearing thin leather patrician boots made with detail of the separate leather strips. It could be of interest to know that a fragment from an equestrian statue of Augustus found in Greece has Augustus wearing similar attire. He used to hold the horse's reins, but these are today lost. His eyes are looking over and beyond any viewer on the ground, and his right arm points slightly downward with his fingers in that iconic gesture that is supposedly signaling command and clemency at once. It has been theorized that even the naturalistic horse might be a portrait of an individual. For example, the teeth seem to be quite individualistic. Bones and veins are visible on its face. This is, of course, impossible to know today. Another peculiarity in the visualization of the horse is its detailed saddle blanket. It seems to be of Sarmatian style and was probably intended to signal the victory over the Sarmatian Yasidji in 175, placing the statue late in Marcus Aurelius' reign. Another fascinating detail is that of the horse's raised front leg. The animal clearly seems to be in movement, in the way that the parade horse perhaps would rise its hoof. This, however, is not as it used to be. We know from earlier medieval descriptions that the hoof used to be resting on a conquered enemy. This, of course, changes the whole impression of the image. This kind of imagery was quite common in Rome. We know, for example, that an equestrian statue, now lost of Domitianus, used to step on a personification of the River Rhine. And we know, of course, of other statues of conquered barbarians. This scenery would undoubtedly give the composition a different feel, but perhaps more logical. 
since we also know that the way Marcus Aurelius holds his hand is a message of power. And in one of the surviving panels of Marcus, we can see an almost identical scenery, with Marcus, the stepping horse, and the barbarians kneeling in front of the emperor. Marcus Aurelius is holding his hand, just as the statue, signalling clemency, a clemency only shown by Rome after total surrender. Although one might say that there is not much clemency projected in an image with a horse stepping on an enemy. Originally thus, the projection was probably less that of a philosopher and more of a victorious emperor of Rome. Speaking about the power of the imperial image and about the beautiful charisma of Marcus' statue. The image is so powerful and so iconic that it has transcended not only through the centuries but through millennia. It is not possible to exaggerate the impact that the statue has had on the European imagery from the Renaissance to our days. It became the standard after which statues were made, and the examples are probably in the hundreds. To give a few, we can see it in a statue cast in 1465 by Pietro Avellino, and in Donatello's statue of Erasmo di Nani, or in those of Cosimo de' Medici, Louis XIV, and of Bismarck, or even as far north as here in Sweden, in both the statue of King Karl IX in Gothenburg or that of King Karl XIV Johan in Stockholm. <laughs> Hi again. If you like this video, click that like button and share a link with your friends. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And if you would like to help me to make even better documentaries about the past in the future, please consider joining me at Patreon. I've put a link to my site in the description below. See you soon.